so I have one hand here. We'll take a few questions and give an opportunity to respond. Is there anyone else? Thank you very much, Rebecca um, Katsissi. So I just want to ask a question which might seem stupid, but was Life Pesa Domini a private uh, service yeah. provider? Okay, I mean, so the reason I'm asking that question is, what was their role in the whole transfer of patients? Did they resist allowing patients to leave? And I'm also asking this in the context of the National Health Insurance, uh, which is going to be built upon public and private and NGOs all working together, and you saying that this is probably going to be repeated if things don't change. So did they provide any resisting role or um, were they questioned at these hearings? Um, yeah, I was just interested. who is the CEO was brought to testify specifically because we wanted to know what was happening on the other side uh, and why the patients uh, were allowed to be moved. Um, and his evidence, I mean, it's worth, it's worth actually going back to his transcript as well. And he also broke down in the course of the hearings because he did, and others did try to resist, but the department literally forcefully took the patients uh, and uh, and insisted that you know certain medication must be provided, but he also said that all of the medication wasn't available because they just didn't have that kind of stock all in one go for so many patients, and that they warned the department about this. But the department said, "Well, we'll just get a public health clinic closest to the NGO, which didn't." Have Thanks, Adiva. That was a really important um, presentation. Mine is more a reflection than a question, per se, because it strikes me that we have a very, very fundamental problem, which is a, the combination of a deeply authoritarian culture in the state um, so there's the talk about instructions from above, I mean, throughout the public service, that is what happens, which is partly a legacy of the past. Um, it is partly um, a very easy way out, so be, because you then don't have to take responsibility. Um, and it takes courage not to obey when the instructions come the, the way they often do. Um, and that is a courage that not very many people have. Um, so, uh, plus, a big problem is also that the, that the way we very often respond in, in the public sector to things are going wrong is with further compliance and further audit requirements. And so, reinforcing a compliance culture rather than a culture of acting ethically. And as I was listening to you, I was thinking something like this section 195 is probably something that is not very widely known. And it made me think, given that we are sitting in winter school, there is a task here of actually spreading that information, I mean, training civil servants to actually act ethically and act mor morally, uh, both in terms of their legal obligations, but also in terms of their other professional obligations. So I think that is worth thinking further because it's difficult, it's hard to think one's, one's way out of the situation as it is at the moment. Now that's triggered a few more hands, quite a number. Uh, would you like to respond immediately? Or I completely agree. agree. And if I can assist in any way, I'd like to. So let's go to the young lady Thank you very much for that. Um, mine is 
also more observation, question, mixture. There's just a lot happening. <laughs> um, section 195, um, when you mentioned it, it clicked in my head that aren't the Batutini uh, principles derived from section 195, which are like should in most public sector of our, our government be placed on the walls, which says people first, but to be the principles 195. So when you say that, it sort of like struck me that, oh, but that's our government, but to be principles. So it's really strange that we keep on moving away from that. And also there's just this trend that seems to happen not only within health, but we see it across in, in housing, in water, in electricity, that there's a trend where simply those who make the decisions over people's lives don't care. And so how, how do we address that? How do we, how do we legislate on morality and ethics when what's in the Constitution 195 is completely flouted? How do we codify and teach people how to be moral and care and be humane? Because that seems to be the gap where we just don't have that. And the powers that be are there clearly to push their own agendas and tick boxes, but don't really care what happens with the decisions that they make. So that gap right there, how do we legislate ethics? My question is related to what Uta was saying. I've previously worked in the public sector. And what advice is there? Because I've had a situation where I disagreed with what I was being told to do. And I was at that point a very newly qualified dietitian. So I was working alone. I phoned one of the tertiary hospitals to speak to their head of department who told me they agreed with what I said, but that this was the policy. and. Everyone I spoke to said, well, it's the policy, you've got to do what the policy says. And, <laughs> yeah, how does one do deal with that? So, there's actually a provision of the law in the Public Service Administration Act, I think, which, or in the regulations, which specifically says that you don't have to obey an order if you think it's an unlawful order. Right? So there's <laughs> firstly that hurdle which you've got across. So it's not that you just can't, I mean, there would be potentially a bit of chaos if you didn't, you know, implement as, as, uh, as a lower level <coughs> official. But if you think it's unlawful, there is a provision that allows you to put that in writing. And even if it doesn't change anything, you're able to show that you made an attempt rather than saying, I didn't, uh, I didn't have any power, so I just did nothing. Before, I have kept a note of the people on the other side of the room. Sorry, and I'm just going to say, even in the military, you don't have to do that anymore. Even in the military, there's no more obeying orders. So why should they be in the public health? <laughs> yes, I'm a render officer, and um, I had the unfortunate, I suppose, um, opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Manamela, and so I'm the point person for mental health in the province. Um, my question is probably very similar to the previous speaker, but I think we all work in a bureaucracy and a system, and if I look at where I'm at, I'm not at a level of, of decision making, but the bureaucracy says exactly like that, you follow channels, and you report to those people, and if you step out of line, um, you pay the consequences of that. So, um, how how are you? Is are your previous answers probably covering that? But are we protected? Because if you look at the Mental Health Care Act, technically, I should have completed. I'm sitting here, and I have to admit that I should have completed a, f a, four, a two form every week. 
of this year. And, that, and that's my legal um, obligation. But how do I balance that with what my managers and the department wants? Um, in your talk, you mentioned accountability, you mentioned the role of leaders and managers in this whole thing that has been hap that happened at Lighter City Mini. I just wanted some advice from you for young leaders and young managers as what lessons can we draw on accountability on this case so that we prevent and to ensure that this um, similar situation never happens in our context and in the in situa in institutions where we are. Thanks so much, Adila. Um, so do you think the fact that the managers were healthcare professionals makes it that much more heinous? You know, our former Minister of Health did absolutely terrible things and she was a doctor. You know, so Dr. Manamona um, is a nurse, I think. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Sedabon is a medical doctor. So bad policy making is done by all our politicians, the Minister of um, Minerals and energy can tell the community of Kolobeni you're going to get mining, flout the constitution, but he's not a health professional. So is there something special about this case that really deserves our attention? Mm -hmm. Can I have one more? <coughs> Go ahead. Good evening, I'm Carol Dean, and I work for the Department of Health. I'm not sure if I should have my head in shame, uh, but I won't. Um, that was Amazing, so thank you. Uh, it's also a really emotional talk. But my question is, um, how will we prevent this going forward? And how do we not um, dissociate ourselves from public service? We, we hear, um, there are many of us, and it's not a defensive response, um, and we want to do the right thing, and I'm sure we have our blind spots but UWC is all of 20 k's away from the hospital that I lead. UCT, med school is all of about six k's, and I think we work quite closely together. Um, but rather than blame and shame and get into our dark corners, how are we going to work more jointly and collectively going forward? Because I think that's the, how do we keep each other accountable? And if there's stuff that you need to call us out on as the whole of society, where is that space? And how do we create that space? So I don't want to rush into solution mode, but I also think that uh, the one thing life is that many has taught us, um, or just alarmed us to, is that we, we can't be, um, what, negligent, and we can't put on our blinkers, and we have to acknowledge that we're not perfect as a system. But at the same time, we have our constraints, and so how are we going to deal with that? And that has to be more than me, the manager of Falkenberg right now, or you, the manager of something else. And how are we going to take hands and do this? Because resources are finite, and, and that's the reality. At the same time, how do we balance that with human rights? That would be interesting. Hi, <coughs> thank you. My name is Dumelo. I'm at the school. Um, great presentation, great representation in the inquiry. Um, I just, it's just a reflection. Um, the city of Cape Town is going to find homeless people who are sleeping on pavements. Um, and I'm assuming it's because if they are well lit, it's low risk for them. Um, I'm not sure what the reason is, but you have people being killed in Pretoria. So what are the rights of the homeless people in, you know, in these areas? It sounds very similar to the SD mini um, tragedy. Mm -hmm. There is one last question over here, so I just want to give the mic to Stephen Salaski. Thank you very much. Um, 
for that really um, disturbing and important um, talk. My name is Christina Zorowski. I'm at the University of Montreal in Canada, and I'm also with the University of Western Cape. Um, um, I have a, a, well, two questions, or a question and a reflection. The reflection is around collective responsibility and uh, personal responsibility. Um, and where in the law do you get both that if, if the other, if we don't want collective responsibility in its individual responsibility, then the minister resigns or somebody gets fired, um, but that lets everyone else off the hook. So can collective responsibility not also mean each of us collectively and individually, jointly and separately or whatever is responsible and how does that play out? Um, the question that I have about the hearing and the, and the way that the case unfolded, we heard at the very beginning that it was it was um, triggered by uh, concerns to, to save money uh, and cut costs, and we had the you know the 112 rand budget. It reminded me of my first visit to Robben Island, where you had the the rations for black uh, or African colored and Indian uh, people, and somebody decided. So how how did 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 that decision to close the institution and to assign the budget, those were not decisions presumably that were made within the Department of Health. How did all the other departments fit in? How did the financial uh, decision making in the budgeting process uh, fit in and in terms of attribution of responsibility uh, and authority? So there's a whole range. I know it's very That's fine, but there's a whole very, very, uh, um, yeah, those are all very challenging questions. Um, let me just start from the, from the last. Um, when, when I speak about collective responsibility, I'm, I'm referring more to the political principle where you take responsibility, it's that you take responsibility as an institution, as a department, rather than even a head or uh, of, of the institution. So in this case, the MEC resigned, and you know that wasn't accountability. Um, and we still are yet to find out what was happening. I know there were complaints to professional, um, the professional bodies, uh, Leslie, the HPCSA, and the Nursing Council in relation to the and Marmela. And I don't know, you know, where that is now. There are also criminal charges which. I understand now investigations against at least one person, but I don't know which one it is. It's completed, and whether there'll be prosecutions remains to be seen. Um, the the decision on the budget, so that we explored quite uh, in, in some detail also in the hearing because um, we had to actually analyze the budgets, and the MEC for finance uh, at the time, Robert Barbara Creasy, testified, and disavowed um, any, not just so much knowledge, but uh, you know, any sort of relationship with the decision. Um, and we were able to find um, budget speeches and, um, you know, so you know after the budget is, is announced, there's the budget speech um, and other uh, correspondence which, and in media, someone had interviewed either her or somebody else in finance, um, saying that this is not true, that there is no reason, there is no reason to cut the budget. There, there were resource constraints in general in the province, and the province is very strained. But <laughs> the MEC and the finance department had made it clear that what you cut back on are non-essential non expenditure. And that was repeated publicly, <laughs> that what must be cut back on is non-essential expenditure. So it had nothing to do with the budget. Um, and, and, and there's, the, yeah, there, there, there's some explanations for what actually was going on, because it was also at the time of local government elections and all of that. So, but um, certainly finance said that there was no need for it. And they had said so at the time, not only after the fact. Um, yeah, the, 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 um, it, it really, really made me think, Leslie, of Mantu. Matlangu behaved like that. And um, so she's not a doctor, Matlangu. But Barney Salabano was a good doctor. And 
it was unbelievable what was going on and that he would actually lie under oath. Uh, Dr. Manavela is a psychiatric nurse with a PhD. That's where the doctor comes from. So there is, in my view, a greater responsibility on people in that position, not merely because of their seniority versus, for example, Ms. Hana Yokovis is making the decisions on the ground in NGOs, but can't really make decisions. But in those people, because they have professional ethical guidelines that go beyond any other government official, and, um, and they pay no respect to those in fact, not just professional ethical guidelines, but they take an oath. Um, not just the oath of the Constitution, which the MEC has to take, but in the case of the, the doctors, they take uh, their professional oath. Um, and so it, it reminded me a lot of that, um, and, and worse, actually. You know, I mean, it reminded me of stories of the Holocaust. And I, I said it in, 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 I think, in the argument, but you know, as you're sitting in those hearings, that phrase, Hannah Arendt, the banality of evil, kept going through my mind because that, that was how it came across. And uh, it, it, was, it was quite astounding, um, without minimizing what happened in the Holocaust, the similarities between some of the attitudes uh, that manifested in Esidemeni. And I think, <coughs> so as far as, uh, um, as far as the, your question about the difficulties and the importance of collaboration, how, what do you do? One of the things is to listen. And Matlango never listened, and Manamela never listened. I mean, how could you not listen to all of these warnings? Yeah. So, and I want to say again, it's not easy, and it's not, um, um, yeah, you know, People don't expect you to be a hero. But if you are told, and you're taken to court, and you still don't do it, what, what then is the excuse? You can't then say, but you know, I didn't have uh, the power, and I don't have this, and I don't have that. Um, so, so it was that level of, of, um, of, of arrogance. So I think that what, what helps is to just listen. You don't have to agree. but. If you create a culture in which people feel they can speak in your presence and disagree in your presence um, as a manager, then that will go a long way to coming to the right decision ultimately, even if you don't agree with what they say. I don't know if I left any book, but, but it, uh, well, that also answers part of your question about management. Thanks. Thank you. There'll be a, um opportunity afterwards also reception for a follow-up of the conversation. Um, I know it's a very late evening, this is a very emotional subject, but a very important one. Um, so I'm going to ask Professor David Saunders to reflect <coughs> and give the vote of thanks, and I'm sure he'll have his own reflections to add. Thank you, Asha, and, um, and Adila, it really is an honor to had you here tonight. Um, it was a very touching, powerful, and also um, salutary talk that you gave us, not just applicable you know, to this. Because there are many other, and you told me that one of the cases you're working on is of uh, the toddler who drowned in the country. So there are many, many such examples. Which is really, I suppose, a shame on all of us. So, um, this is called um, the lecture on public health and social justice. So, we're very proud here at, um, at this school for combining those two. So, I've just been involved this week with quite a small class, great class doing a course which is called Globalization and Health. And it gets very political. Because it's pretty clear that what you describe for South Africa is not dissimilar actually from 
what is going on in many other countries where ethical and moral values are being sacrificed for economic <coughs> considerations. And we know that those economic considerations actually, and there are lots of data to back this up, are benefiting a smaller and smaller percentage of the global population and national populations. We know that. I mean, South Africa, of course, has extreme inequality. We know that the top 10% uh, in this country earn the same income as uh, the other 90%, and it's getting worse. And we know that globally, eight men control the same income as 3.7 billion people off of the world's population. So this is not, I think, unconnected with what we are seeing, that um, the dollar is trumping human value. So in this course on globalization, and I promise I won't go on too long, when our students, we call them students, but actually they are very experienced practitioners themselves, get very depressed, usually after I've been on it. They say, well, what can we do? So, we, myself and Leslie today, gave a very similar uh, kind of presentation. He said, well, in public health, and of course, as Uta said, we see public health very broadly. Um, I think I'm the only medical doctor, actually, in this whole um, enterprise here. Um, quite different from when I studied public health. Um, sorry, two of us. <laughs> two of us. I just think of you as a social scientist. <laughs> so, um, so people are asking, what do they do? What can they do? So we talked about it a bit. And um, we kind of structured what we could do into kind of four categories. Doing research, social determinants, health systems, from an ethical standpoint, and using this evidence for advocacy, trying to model good practice in your work, whether you're a clinician or a public health practitioner. And most important, to use all of this to engage in social mobilization, or to at least provide <coughs> assistance to those who are involved. And of course, you were doing that in the heroic uh, treatment campaign. So, People get a bit startled about the social mobilization, and they think we're very political. We're a bit extreme here at the School of Public Health. So I just want to say that I think we are doing what the father of public health, Rudolf Virchow, said we should do. So Rudolf Virchow was a German physician he developed cell theory. He was a kind of acclaimed scientist. But he also said, and it's a famous quote, he said many things. But one of his famous quotes was, medicine is a social science, and politics is nothing more than medicine on a large scale making the point very profoundly that health is political. And I think that until we in health get this message across, it is not just technical. Yes, it's technical, it's scientific, but it's also political. And that kind of thinking, I think, needs to permeate the health sector, if it did, and if there was social mobilization,
to hold all of us accountable, i.e. participatory democracy, not just representative democracy, which isn't really representative anyway in South Africa. I think that is part of the struggle for health. So just thank you very much. It was touching. sense we're a very proud school of public health but we're also very informal so we don't have long speeches but we're really incredibly grateful for you coming here traveling here to speak with us on such an important issue and being a really incredible role model for the next generations that we need to train here um, so I want to thank you again and thank you Professor David Saunders for also being an incredible mentor over multiple generations. And I want to welcome all of you to the reception um, to interact for further questions, follow up. Um, let's get out of this room and this very structured lives. Thank you very much.